is all right welcome everyone uh today's session we have alan uh, Kusin, and we have bethany smith with the uh, fsusd school board um we have a we have our special guest to join us and tell us about this her story right through uh, PLTI, which Alan is going to be sharing more in a little bit. But first, uh, a couple of things. If you are here live, right, with us on this Zoom call, uh, just be aware that we are recording this event. We will be sharing it with the rest of the PLTI uh, alumni. Uh, so if you do not want to, your face showing up on, on camera, you can simply turn off your, uh, your, your video. Uh, also, if you would like to, if you please will keep yourself muted if you're not talking uh, so that to prevent uh, background noise, we we'll appreciate that. Uh, and also, uh, if you do want to uh, ask questions, you can definitely unmute yourself uh, or raise your hand, or you can use the chat feature to uh, ask questions. Uh, we are live on Facebook as well, so for those of you that are uh, on Facebook, um, use the comment section uh, to ask questions. Let us know where you're joining from, if you're watching us live or if you're watching the replay. Uh, also, let us know if you can hear us just fine. And you can post questions too on, on the comment. Uh, uh, it, this is going to be recorded and distributed. So uh, if there are questions that are not uh, answered in this session, uh, we're sure more than happy Alan and Bethany can uh, get back on those questions. Um, with that said, uh, Alan, hand it over uh, to you. Thanks, Leo. And I see that Rocio Moreno joined us. Welcome. Welcome, Rocio. And uh, and son, right? Very cool. Yes. Right. <laughs> nice to see you, Rocio. Likewise, nice to see you. Yeah. So. Um, we had a brainstorm about a month ago, you know how that goes. And Monica and I and Leo are working closely with the alumni. And we were thinking like, okay, so what can we do to get them more engaged or at least the community know what good work you guys are doing. So we came up with the idea of live chats and focus our PLTI alumni so um, we're gonna be doing more of that, which uh, I'll talk about later. But we also are strategic with PLTI. We know that Bethany's running for, uh, she's running for office, um, campaigning hard. Um, hopefully she'll be reelected. And she's a PLTI graduate. So we thought, hmm, why don't we start off with Bethany, talk a little bit about herself, her background, PLTI, um, and um, basically her role as a school board member, the pandemic, so there's a lot to cover, okay? We have an hour, we have to end at six. So um, what I was gonna do, you guys alumni, was talk a little bit about PLTI. Um, you guys all know about PLTI. And, um, but what I thought we could do, and Bethany, this will be my curveball, had nothing to do with you right now, but since we have all PLTI alum. So uh, Amanda and Rocio, Leo, if you want, just real quickly, anything that you can talk about in terms of either how your life has changed because of PLTI or what you got out of it. So is that okay? Yeah. Uh, kind of give uh, you and and let's keep in, keep in mind that, you know, we might be sharing this elsewhere. And so there might be individuals who watch this that aren't familiar with PLTI. So I don't want that to be a missed opportunity. I was just gonna say, um, I was just gonna that. say that Bethany, definitely great idea. So, okay. so yeah, I, I echo what Bethany is saying. Okay, so let's let's do the quick thing and then I'll uh, I'll fill in the missing pieces. So Amanda and Rocio, anything you wanna mention about PLTI? Rocio, do you wanna go first? Go, okay. and then I will copy whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I want to say PTLI came to me at a very um breaking point in my life, and it was very, very um emotional for me that that whole section of my life, that class, everything, and it just brought to my attention how many people are in the community 
that are feeling the same things that are feeling like they're back in the corner and don't know how to make changes and asking the same questions, but feeling like there's not really any answers. And I feel like this class has put us on a path to where we not only can find an answer, but then know how to go forward and get results and make changes and, you know, bring awareness. So I really feel like PTLI not only helped me put me on my track in my, in my awareness on what I wanted to be as, you know, as a human, as a mom, but also as, you know, a part of my community, like, and what I'm doing for other people, not just for myself and my family. So I, I don't, I don't know. I, it's hard to express what PTLI has done for me, but it, the educational wise, it's, it's really opened my eyes to how things only change when people get involved to changing. Excellent. Thank you, Amanda. Rocio? Do we have Spanish speakers as well, or it's only in English? Uh, at this point, it's only in English. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, PLTI for me has been a, an opportunity to broaden my horizons. It was, I love my group. It was a challenge to um, also go with different um, cultural backgrounds. I'm Hispanic and most of the time I have been with Hispanic or Anglo community, but then I got the opportunity to um, participate in the classes with um, other nationalities. So that was a very amazing experience because that showed me that we are humans in every culture and every background and any uh, challenges that we face despite our origins, despite our cultural background, despite our appearance, still we are, um, we have a common core of needs, a common core of goals, of dreams, of things that we would like to accomplish. So for me, PLTI was just a, a, a big opportunity to go beyond and knowing that there is other people who has the same goals, the same wishes and desires and the same, um, that thriving for helping others. So I don't know, it was a great, great experience. And then because my child was with me, he was included and he was part of it. So then also he had the opportunity to, le to learn and to grow and to see that there is something else and mm -hmm that when you act with others, we are stronger. So. Excellent, thank you so much, Giovanni, thank you. Uh, quickly, Karen, you wanna, you were in class number two that was all in Spanish. Hi, uh, so yes, I grew up so much with your class, Alan, and uh, Ms. Um, uh, Raquel and Maria Marin. That's the best teacher showed me a lot of things that I don't know about school, I don't know about um, uh, happens in a school, how you use your voice to say something to other ones. And then they give me like tools to help the other people. Thank you so much for staying in your class. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so real quickly, I'll give kind of an overview, but you guys, it's from the heart, right? That's why it's really important. So um, PLTI is a civic leadership initiative that started in 2015. I was with the Children's Network and I felt like we needed to get parents together because in the past it was like, it's, we're only parents and parents need to be at the table uh, particularly when decisions are being made every day from public officials. So we reached out, we had 25 people the first year, we had 20 people uh, all in Spanish the second year and the third year about 15. So we have uh, graduates, alumni like Bethany and like Leo and Karen and Rocio and Amanda and many, many, many others that are doing amazing work in their communities, especially in these trying times. So um, real quickly, we, we had a toolbox that parents were able to kind of dabble in that had to do with uh, public speaking, how government works, um, how to influence change for parents and their children. Um, and we'd often have speakers, but as we mentioned before, it was a very intensive 20 week course 
And in addition to that, and I think Bethany will talk about this, everybody was required to do a community project. Um, so we had three years, like I said, and uh, people are still doing a, an amazing job. Okay, so uh, let's get going. We we'll wanna get our featured <laughs> guests going. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bethany Smith. Again, Bethany is currently school board member of FSUSD, Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. Uh, it's a four year term, which I just learned. And uh, she, was she graduated PLTI 2015. And the next year she got up her, you know, whatever to like, Beth Bethany is so good with civic engagement, public service. So she decided to run for office. She won in 2016, very excited. When I looked at Bethany and running her campaign, it's just like everything else. She's so methodical. <laughs> she knows what she's doing. She's very personable. And she wore out a lot of shoes probably, but she does grassroots stuff. So um, again, we're really happy to get her. She's very busy. We're down to the last few days, but she knows where she came from in terms of parent voices. She represents parents. So Bethany, it's such a pleasure for to have you here uh, tonight. So thank you so much, okay? Um, so tell us a little bit first about, briefly about you and your children. Sure, um, well, like you said, I, I'm currently on the school board, but uh, you know, I actually am not a native of California. I grew up in Texas and then came out here in 2003. And so I have been in Sassoon City ever since. I moved into one house and then I moved to another house and then I moved to another house, but all of them have been in Sassoon City. Um, you know, I, I love, uh, I went from the big city of Dallas to now being in a small town where one direction I have all of the city, you know, that I need. And when I go the other direction, it's all, you know, just beautiful rolling hills. Um, you know, now I don't have four malls within 15 minutes of me, but you know, you got to take some trade-offs. Um, but yeah, I have uh, two kids. I have one that's 21 and another that's 16. Um, oh. They both were students in FSUSD and um, you know, one graduated in 2017, now independent and living on their own. Um, but I still have one that is um, still my little baby. He's six foot two and <laughs> you know, 16 years old, but he'll always be my baby. <laughs> so. That's, Good. That's a little bit about that. Yeah. yeah. So let's get into leadership and civics. So kind of when were you interested and in how did you get involved when you were younger? Sure. And I was I was thinking about this uh, question when you sent it to, you know, the kind of ideas of what you wanted to talk about and you know, what's the interest in leadership? And I thought back, I'm like, man, I think I was born meant, you know, I, I was meant for it from, from birth. I was born on January 1st, the first day of a brand new decade. I'm a Capricorn and, you know, I'm not huge into Zodiac or anything, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that ring true about, about that Capricorn. I was raised an only child. So it's just kind of part of my nature, that leadership quality. And, um, but, you know, my, my engagement in being a leader in the community they actually began when I was that quote unquote stay at home mom. I actually, uh, you know, somebody said, hey, you need to get out and do something. I had a child that was a year and a half and, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of friends in the community. Like I said, I had just moved uh, to California in 2003. This was 2005. And so I said, you know what, all right, let me go up. I'm gonna see what there is out there for me. And I found a local mom's club. It's mother's, uh, oh, what is it? It's an acronym, M-O-M-S, uh, mom's club. And I joined that and all of a sudden there was this opportunity for me to join their executive board. And so I did, and I ended up serving and I think probably five different roles on that. I always said, don't, I will never run for treasurer. So please don't ask me to do that. 
<laughs> that's not that's not really uh, what I'm into, but you know, um, I was able to help support them from going to a member from a membership of about 30 people to over 75, and we got really engaged in a lot of things that were going on in our community. Um, and then after both my kids were in school full time, I spent four years leading a couple of the parent teacher organizations at their schools and became a parent leader for, um, I was an alternate for one of the schools and then full-time for the other. And the parent leader, in case people aren't aware and wanna go look into it, um, each school has a designated parent leader and they take part in a monthly meeting with the superintendent. I now looking back on it, having been one of those parent leaders and now being a board member, I'm realizing, oh, wow, they, that was like a mini school board meeting. So you're hearing a lot of the same things and engaging in a lot of the same activities that you would potentially as a school board member. Um, and then there was a certain point in time where I was appointed to planning commission just shortly before um, I, I went on to be elected to school board. I think I was actually on planning commission at the time that I was in PLTI. So, um, but that was a nice way, you know, you're not having to run for an election, but you're engaged, you're involved in something in city leadership. Um, it's a very small time commitment in, uh, at least in Sassoon City, uh, because it is fairly small. Um, but that, those are some ways that I think if somebody is interested in going into those sort of leadership roles, that they could, um, where they could start from. Great. And talk a little bit about PLTI, because I know it was five years ago. I know. <laughs> yeah. long, but yeah, you're, you, were, yeah. you were in the first year class. Mm -hmm. um, so talk a little bit about first how you heard about it and then a little right. bit about kind of. Well, you asked me about that on the phone and I said, Alan, it has been five years. That's a really long time. I don't know if I can, I can think of how the, uh, how I actually came to find out about it, but Google has a really good function in their search, uh, for <laughs> your, through your Gmail account. And I actually found an email that I had sent to an individual who worked for the school district. And I said, hey, I found this on the district's Facebook page. They have an orientation next Tuesday and I think I'm gonna go. So that is how I came to learn about PLTI. It was on January 8th of 2015. Wow, nice. Yeah. So what else in terms of what I remember, I think with you, cause you have the leadership skills that was all there, but I think public speaking, it was helpful. We, I think, the PLTI, you guys, it's a joke. We three minutes. We always stress that parents, when they talk, it's three minutes because if you go to a school board meeting yep. or another board of supervisors, public comment, three minutes. That's three it. Minutes. You yeah. Make the you've, point, right? Yeah, you've got to be succinct. You've got to make sure that you're getting your entire message across in three minutes. And yeah, it, it definitely. I didn't have a whole lot of experience. Um, you know, presenting to a group. I had been, I, like I said, I've been a stay-at-home mom. I was a stay-at-home mom for 10 years. And the last time I had had a, a job and, and been a member of the workforce, I was doing visual merchandising and design. And that's, you know, what I went to school for. Um, I, I, so I didn't have that sort of experience really with speaking in front of groups. And so that was, you know, something that got me a little bit more comfortable with it. I don't think anybody is ever not nervous about speaking in public, no matter, you know, how seasoned a professional you are speaking, you know, in front of people gets your butterflies going, but it certainly helped. And um, Rocio was mentioning, you know, being able to uh, collaborate with people that are different than you. And I think that that's a very common thing where, you know, you're, you're in your little community, you know, you know, the, the individuals that you interact with the most. And so I didn't have a huge, uh, you know, range of experience, even in such a diverse community with working with other individuals that maybe had a different, you know, history of, uh, of life. Uh, you know, they're all walking their own unique paths. And I didn't, um, I didn't necessarily have that experience in, in working with those um, you know, it's interesting. Other than myself. So, 
<laughs> so racial equity comes up a lot from both our area and PLTI, I forgot to mention, is all over the country. There's over yeah. 20 states. Um, but what I heard a lot loud and clear from first year graduates is, you know, just what we're talking about, that it's one of the first times that they could um, talk to people of different ethnicities, different culture, mm -hmm. um, because people weren't accustomed to doing that. And one of the nice things about PLTI and the national is it's predicated on a diverse group of people. Uh, and we certainly have that in Solano. I think our parent graduates reflect the makeup of the community. Absolutely. So Bethany, we're gonna, we're gonna plow forward. We have a lot of questions and coming up on my part and then uh, mm -hmm. other people. So um, let's take it from there. Um, tell us a little bit about your community project as well as Inspire. Bethany, a lot of you don't know, has been amazing advocate for youth in employment services. So talk to us about that. Right. Um, so INSPIRE, and everybody thinks it must be an acronym because that's the world that we live in these days. No, it's not an acronym. It is actually just called INSPIRE. And um, it came about uh, really uh, just, I happened across a Facebook post of all things, um, a Facebook post that a cousin of mine who was on a governing board in um, Missouri, uh, she shared this thing and it was um, the My Success event. And it took all of these sophomores from districts around Northwestern Missouri, brought them to a location where they got to do this hands-on career fair career fair. And I said, you know what, I think we need something like this in Solano County, because it was, I, I was just really impressed. I, after I saw it, I went to their website and looking at all of these things. And so um, I actually brought it forward to the district and I'm, you know, going to cut out a lot of the middles, but um, you know, we, I talked to the school district, I talked to our um, chamber of commerce and you know it was very quickly that everybody was like yeah we need to do this let's let's do it and um you know we did a whole lot of planning took probably a year um to to get it down and um held our first one for we decided let's do it for eighth graders and so we um, that's where it started, and this um, this year is actually sadly the first year that they did not uh, get to host it because of the coronavirus. But it has grown every single year, and in fact, now we have a sophomore component um, that actually takes kids from their school sites and deploys them out into the community to learn about jobs that they might be able to have, and you know the the eighth grade. Career fair is pretty similar. Um, everybody comes to one location and they get to do hands-on things and find out about, I think we average about 40 different employers, um, you know, that kids get to learn about, okay, these are the kinds of jobs that are available. And this is the type of education that I need to have so that I can get that job. And so, um, you know, the, that's why we do it in eighth grade so they can start setting up their um, high school courses and select based on maybe what they want to do later in life. But now it includes um, almost every single Solano County School District. Um, YOLO, I know, has been looking into it. I don't know if they had actually begun um, doing it, but Napa County also has some districts that are taking part and it's gone on to win statewide recognition for innovation and education. And it's just, it's so humble to look back on it now and see how far that it's come. Yeah, it'd be kind of interesting to see if there could be some kind of longitudinal study evaluation on mm -hmm. kids that have kind of gone through Inspire in terms of how they do when they're older, right. getting a yeah. job. That's yes, and, and we've talked about you know how do we how do we measure these things, and I I go back to that whole PLTI thing of if it matters we measure if it 
if we measure it matters. And, and so I think that it would be lovely to do that. And so on the horizon, we're looking at the potential for adding a senior component that maybe would include internships. So I think that would be a huge leap forward. And so okay. very helpful. Good. So let's transition to uh, your role as a board member. I have some specific questions and I think everybody we're doing pretty good. We're 30 minutes into this and we have another 30. Okay. So um, tell us a little bit, Bethany, on uh, when and why you decided to run for the school board. Uh. Um, I think I decided it was probably somewhere in 2014 that I really started considering it. Um, and actually, I had a, a dear friend, and um, they are also an elected individual in our community. They said, you know what, I want to see you either on city council or on school board. And I said, well, my heart is with the kids, not with the streets. So I will take school board. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just just having that person that believed in, you know, my ability to serve doing something like that, it, it really, you know, made me think that this idea that I'd been batting around might actually be a thing that I could do. And um, it just so happened that the timing worked out. A longtime incumbent in the district had decided that they weren't gonna run. And so it was a little earlier than I actually had thought that I would run, but it's very rare that you get to run uh, like where you're not um, going up against an incumbent. And so it just, it felt like the, the right opportunity. And so I'm glad that I stepped on it when I did. Great. And had you had any experience prior to not so much running a campaign, but helping a campaign? Um, I was the co-chair on the Measure J school facilities bond campaign. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a picture still. I wish that I had pulled it up. I should have um, a view of me out door to door, um, you know, passing out flyers. And I know the the Yes on Kids campaign was going. I felt a little less involved in those uh, measures, but um, you know, being involved in that to a certain degree as well. So talk about kind of the high points of the campaign and some of the low points. <laughs> low points are not, not the fun thing to talk about, <laughs> but let's get, we'll end on the high note. So why don't we, we'll talk about the low first. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the low part was, you know, not getting some of the endorsements that I hoped that I would get. Um, you know, when, as a candidate, you go out, you do a lot of interviewing and you talk to a lot of groups and individuals and, you know, you don't, uh, you know, there are groups uh, the, like the teacher union, the labor council that represents, you know, unions across all spectrum and, and others. And, you know, you hope that your message is going to resonate with them. And, you know, it's disappointing when people don't feel like you're the right person to represent their needs, but, you know, you just got to pick yourself up and, and get moving on, on the next thing. And so, um, I think the, the high in contrast to that would have been the support from family and friends and, you know, then people who are willing to volunteer their time and their effort and financially contribute because they believe in you. And so, you know, it's, it's very humbling when you have those moments and it certainly does something to, to bring you down, bring you up from that low <laughs> that you might have had before. Okay. And were you confident that you were going to win? <laughs> Absolutely not. No. Um, and surprised? I, were you surprised? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and I think it's healthy to have some doubts, honestly, because I think that it drives you to do everything that you can do. It's the reason even now that, you know, I don't take anything for granted. And um, you know, I'm, I was out on Tuesday and I walked neighborhoods twice in one day and, you know, just trying to get out there and make every single moment count because it's that hard work that I think in the end is what carries you through. And so, 
hopefully people recognize that you know I'm out there doing that hard work and and not taking it for granted. So talk a little bit about the importance and the value of uh, having parent voices be involved in terms of influencing policy that affects their families all the time. Mm. Um, well, I, I tend to say that I feel like I'm the voice of the parents on the board. Um, you know, we're a really diverse board and we each come with our own experiences. And there are others who are on the board who are parents, but they are not parents of current FSUSD students. You know, theirs are, their children are having children. And so um, it's been a while since they might have been um, engaged in in day-to-day -day school activities. And so, you know, I, I see it, my journey is, you know, being that parent in the district. And so, um, I have a different type of knowledge about thing, how things are operating in the district and the schools, and it shapes a lot of the decisions that I make. And so I just always, yeah, try to keep in mind what my experience and those of the parents that are around me, because, you know, yes, my child is older, but I still have friends who have kids who are in elementary school. And um, so I, I am involved a lot with them to, to make sure that the district is doing what they can for all students. Great, so I have one or two more and then Leo will hopefully get some questions from folks. So this is uh, talking a little bit about how you make decisions on matters that come forward to you on the school board and we'll talk about the pandemic. But in terms of kind of how you make decisions, I know you listen to people, your constituents, People provide public comments. I'm sure you talk to your fellow board members, mm -hmm. uh, staff, but just give us a little bit of an idea of what goes through in terms of, you know, getting the knowledge necessary to make an informed vote. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so I I certainly try to take everything into account. You know, we have staff who are providing their recommendations. Um, you know, they put together the reports and the presentations and you know I put a lot of stock into their recommendations you know they are the professionals they're the ones that are doing the work every single day so a lot of it and you know I, I trust that we have hired the right people to do those things and and you know whenever I have interviewed for a job I say that you you hired somebody because um, you know because you believe that they can do the the job the best and so I try to keep that faith that we have hired the people who can do the job the best. But, um, you know, I, I also listen to the public and they either can come and speak during public comment or um, a lot of times we get things via email. I don't get phone calls quite so much, um, uh, but that, those are the two ways that I hear about it from the public. And, um, you know, somebody recently asked me, you know, the, they didn't feel like the board had taken their opinion, their public comment into consideration when a decision was made and they wanted to know how can I effectively communicate with the board so that they will listen to me so that they'll take what I have to say about this issue and, and you know, even consider it. And I say, you know, I can't. I can't speak what's gonna, for what's going to impact other board members, um, but for me, tell me a personal story. Tell me how this is impacting your kids. Tell me how this is, you know, if it's a staff member, how is this affecting your job? Tell me those things, you know, studies, statistics, those are all fine and, you know, they're helpful, And but I find a personal story is more compelling at the end of the day, but, um, I, above all else, I tell them, you know, don't let your emotion, your passion get in the way of the message that they're trying to deliver. And Alan, you reminded me the other day, is just that, <laughs> that I overeat. Do you want to tell people what, what I overeat is? If, uh, well, good. Oh, boy, putting me on this. Uh oh. Well, intellect. the table. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good school board member. Uh, intellect <laughs> over emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So just that. making sure, you know, 
I don't want people to get up there and, and yell and scream and think that that's the way that you're going to get your message across because often I've seen, um, you know, but sometimes myself and sometimes with others, the, that sort of approach really shuts people down. And, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, um, yeah. you're, you're overwriting that message. And so that's- So let's, um, I have one or two more to wrap up and then hopefully we'll get some questions. So the pandemic is on everybody's mind, COVID-19, coronavirus. Yeah. So I know I can imagine as school board members, what you're trying to wrestle with is um, the issue of learning, the best type of learning for children, students are in person, um, and as opposed to distance learning. Um, and um, then you have to balance the health and safety, obviously, of students, of, of uh, faculty, of parents. Um, so tell us without going into, I know you had some votes recently, you don't necessarily have to go into that if you don't want, but just in terms of how do you as a board member, in terms of your values, in terms of acknowledging parent voices, uh, what, how do you deal with that? How do you reconcile? Because it's, it's a no-win situation. There's people on both sides that are strong advocates. So tell us about how you deal with that. I think that's uh... That's the kindest way I've heard somebody put it is, uh, you know, it's a no win situation. And, you know, we, we knew that going into the most recent vote, there were going to be no matter what we decided, there were going to be people that, you know, weren't, weren't in agreement, they didn't approve. And, you know, they, that, that's to be expected. And, and this particular issue you know, it's been very, very polarizing for people. And so, um, you know, when, when we made the decision last spring, originally, you know, I, I don't think there was a single person that, um, that stood up and said, no, we can't do the distance learning thing. What are you talking about? Why are you even considering this? And that is far from the case now. But, you know, at, at that time, we really thought, you know, by fall, we're going to be back, everything's going to be fine, you know, everything, you know, eradicated, and, and we'll be okay. And that was not the case. And so, you know, there, by the time we, you know, came around to needing to make a decision about that towards the end of the summer, you know, the governor literally made it for us. And, you know, we had this inf you know, things come to us twice, uh, for the most part, it's an information item one meeting and the next meeting we're voting on it. So we had the information item and um, we said, well, you know, the governor is supposed to make an announcement. I think it was the very next day. And, um, you know, he might take that out of our control and make the decision on our behalf. And he did that. And so, um, you know, uh, I think, unfortunately, you know, that, it gave the appearance that the district, that the staff in the district had not been doing anything all summer because, you know, we had been gearing up and, okay, we're going to, you know, at least come back part time. We're going to have, you know, these five phases and we're going to, you know, have some students back in the classroom on some days. And, and what people didn't see behind the scenes was that, you know, they were working extremely hard, but you know, things were changing so rapidly from the state and, you know, from all sorts of different angles that they would start down one road. And then before you knew it, oh, well, you know, crumple that up, put it in the trash can because that, that's not even something that we can consider now. And so, um, you know, but as a parent, um, I was one of those that was sitting back and waiting to see you know, what's going to happen? What is, what can I expect from my kid? If I'm going to be dropping him off at the school, you know, that first day of school, and is he going to be, you know, half there, half here? What's, what is this going to look like? And I know from, you know, the circles that I run in, because I'm a parent and I am friends with a lot of parents, you know, they're all asking kind of the same questions and saying, hey, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do, you know, even after the distance learning thing was established on our behalf. Um, I don't 
know what to do. do I just open up the computer and uh, you know, the Google Meet pops up and, and I don't know who my child's teacher is and, and all of these things. And here we were, I think it was just a couple of weeks out before school started. And um, I, I went to the superintendent and I said, look, some information at this point is better than no information. Even if we don't have all of the answers to all of the questions, parents need to start you know, getting some information because even as, as involved and informed as I am as a school board member, I still didn't know. And so it was, I want to say it was later that day or the very next day that I noticed that things were starting to be released and, you know, pr principals were getting in touch with parents and saying, okay, this is who your student's teacher is. And, um, you know, it, it actually, if you look at the history of you know, when things are typically announced, you know, when you get your teacher assignment, it's usually, I think, the weekend before school even starts. And so I, this I even was, I think, two weeks before, but people were so like, I don't know what to do. And, uh, you know, this is a totally new thing. So that, you know, timeline just didn't seem um, the same, I think, as, as what they expected before. But, um, you know, now, we're at that point where the decision has to be made again. Um, and uh, I think are, people are pretty familiar with the last, um, not the last meeting, but the last time this came up that um, the vote was um, to continue in distance learning and then take up the issue again in January. I actually was the one person that uh, voted against 100% distance learning. It's not to say that I wanted all all our kids back in classrooms, but um, I did think that our families needed to have options and even staff, there are a lot of staff that, you know, want to be back in the classroom and, um, you know, I, I took a lot of time to listen to those stories of the parents and like I said, those are the most compelling thing for me. I was listening to staff that were reaching out via email. I was reading news articles and, and listening to staff recommendations. But um, you know, I, I know firsthand how it's impacting our students, how it's impacting our families. And I think that's the, the reason I was the only one who voted against the 100% distance learning and you know, we, um, we have students that are just not being successful learning from home and it's hurting family dynamics. And my, as I said during the meeting, my family is not excluded from that really harsh reality. You know, there's a lot of stress from this new way of learning and concerns in the world around us. And so, you know, my hope that when is, you know, when this comes up again, is that we can consider maybe a hybrid model. Um, but who knows, uh, you know, that by the time we get back around to the vote, that decision might be made on our behalf again. Um, you know, if we're not in that red, uh, red tier or whatever, whatever the state is referring to it as. Um, so, uh, you know, Above all else, we have to look at minimizing the risks and the, the health and safety of our community. Um, but I think there are ways that we can do it um, to adhere to those physical distancing recommendations, you know, staggering arrival times and lunches and, and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, ideally find some creative ways in the meantime to do some in-person sessions, uh, even if it's outside of regular school hours to ensure those kids who need it the most, who are most vulnerable to learning loss, have access uh, in a way that can, just can't be replicated in distance learning. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll find out in January of 2021. So we'll see, we'll see once we get there, but yeah. But, at the end of the day, we just got to do the best we can in the situation that we're in. Yeah, well, I appreciate your advocacy on behalf of parents and making sure that voices are being heard. So thank you, Bethany, so much. So um, we have um, about 10 minutes, and I know I've kind of, uh, I just felt like I had a lot of questions. So I didn't want people to feel left out, but um, Kind of my editorial comment is here's Bethany, who's a graduate of PLTI, who ran for office, who her her true values are around parents and she listens to them, which is terrific. 
I will say for the general audience that we had another PLTI member who ran for city council in Vallejo. She didn't win, but she got over 10,000 votes and um, she probably will look at running again. And I'm sure there'll be other PLTI members that will either run for office or be in some kind of uh, uh, policy priorities that uh, will impact uh, parents. Um, yeah. And for the general audience, we did go to Sacramento as a PLTI Solano group. We went actually with Merced and Stockton and we got from the state legislature a cool resolution that acknowledges the work of parent leaders in developing policy for families. So um, we're recognized <laughs> along with uh, our other uh, cohorts. So Leo, are there other, any questions in chat or we can just make it more informal if people wanna raise their hand? So just a quick reminder for those here in the live meeting, uh, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask questions. Uh, but first I want to give a shout out to those that have been posting comments in, in uh, Facebook, uh, Rosa Gutierrez, uh, she was part of class three with me. Uh, she says hi to everyone. Uh, Tammy Gaz, uh, she's saying hi to everyone and, and, and putting a lot of uh, input into what a lot of what Bethany is saying. I think she was in your class, uh, Bethany, in 2015. Um, so, so yeah, those quick shout outs, right, to, to Tammy and, and uh, Maria Fernandez and, and, and Rosa for joining us via Facebook. Um, for those of you here in the call, anyone uh, that wants to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. You can press the little microphone button. So Leo, I'm, I'm gonna insist that everybody who's here ask uh, one question. And, and Amanda, you unmuted yourself, you wanna? Yeah, I don't know how we're gonna do this in order, so I feel awkward about <laughs> unmuting, sorry. Um, so I don't know if this is really a question. I just want to say I'm really thankful that you basically had covered a lot of the emotions that I was feeling of this distant learning. And I kind of want to just address that personally, like you said, it is hard for all of us. And I kind of, okay, here, here's a question that I do have that's kind of off the COVID because I really want to know. So when we do back, go back to school, I, at the first few years of elementary, I volunteered a lot for NOAA. And then um, there seemed like there was a gap because the school didn't really encourage it. And then it's like, I feel like there's a lot of like schools that you pay a lot of money to and then it's mandatory that you have to volunteer. And it's like, here it is public school and they're like trying to push the parents out. So it's like, is that more, is that is that like a standard that they're being set that principals are saying like that they're being told like try to keep the parents more off the property, try to keep the parents not walking. Is that like, is that just something they're structured on or is that individual? Principaline, principaline. I don't know how to um, say that. I would, I, I don't know which school or, or which principal that you're referring to, but I think it, quite often in my experience, it has been, um, you know, what does the teacher need? What does the teacher want? And so, you know, there might be some, some teachers that just don't need that support. They don't, they feel like um, they want to keep it a little bit more controlled and have uh, fewer parent volunteers. Um, but I know that as my kids have gotten older, they, they just don't need, you know, the parents, uh, in the classrooms quite as much. And so, um, you know, I, I can't speak for necessarily the situation within your own school, but, and yeah, that was very hard. And I needed to find other ways to occupy my time once, uh, I think once my kids hit around, I don't know, uh, second grade, third grade, I think is when it really started being, you know, not as necessary to, to, um, because the kids can self-manage and so they, they don't need quite as many adults in the room to, to get in the way. <laughs> um, but I, I tried to contribute by being active in their parent teacher organizations. And it came to a point where people just thought I was a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> because I was just there so much and so involved. And I, I just, 
I love being able to give back to them in that way. And, you know, I, I encourage anybody to get involved. Gina tends to be that you get the same kind of people that uh, the same core four or five people that are leading the parent teacher groups and, you know, all the same parents show up, uh, you know, to all of the events. And so um, even if you don't want to be the leader of your parent teacher organization, you know, you can at least step in and say, you know, what, I'll volunteer for the book fair and, and it's a way to keep engaged. All right. Thank all right. you. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rocio, anything you want to add, either a question or a comment? Rosa, uh, sorry, uh, Rosa left, uh, raise her hand second. So Rosa, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to say, um, am I unmuted? Okay. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you, Bethany, for all your hard work. And I also wanted to say that, you know, I, I haven't been as involved as I would like to be with everything going on, but my involvement has been gathering a lot of parents from um, different schools and different um, venues to make sure that they participate in the surveys sent out by the district and to get their voices heard um, and making sure that everybody has access to that. So at least um, their involvement, um, they can be involved and be part of, their voices can be heard through that. And I've been um, closely watching all of the board meetings. And I guess like a quick question I wanted to ask is, um, I think you kind of answered slightly, but I want to know how much does that affect the decision being made once these surveys go out and um, people are voting in different directions? Um, how does that play out? Would it be more beneficial for, for the parents to be at the meetings or the surveys that are being sent out? Which one do you guys consider um, more, I guess? Right. So I, I think it certainly depends on the board member. I look at them differently than, you know, my, my other counterparts. And I was very upfront with the superintendent um, about my putting stock into the most recent survey. Um, I think there were some uh, parameters on it that, um, for example, we got a list of all of the hundreds and hundreds that were made within them. I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that it was upwards of 195 pages, not comments, pages of uh, of a word doc that we were sent to um, you know to look at all of these comments. And some of them had duplicate comments from the parent surveys, which to me says red flag did this individual then submit their communication twice? So I personally said, you know what, I am not gonna put a whole lot of stock into the survey because I didn't feel that it was adequately representing um, who it needed to represent. And so, um, you know, I, I hate that it's kind of a baby with the bathwater sort of scenario where I'm disregarding everything from it because, you know, these comments were in there multiple times. But, um, you know, I, I would have looked at it in, in a different way than, than some of the other board members. So um, somebody did ask me, you know, well, would you be open to it being done again? I honestly think that we got enough um, feedback out of it at the time. I'm not, you know, a supporter of issuing it again. Um, it, I, I just don't think that we need to spend time on that aspect. I think we need to spend more time on how do we make this work? What are our different avenues and put forward some recommendations based on you know, what, those, what those options might be. So, um, and I know there have been some concerns raised around the percentage of individuals that responded to it. And that I, I think is pretty par for the course. Don't quote me on that, but I, as, as I recall, the, the response rate um, was pretty typical for what we normally see. Does that yeah. answer your question? It was a great question. Very yeah, it, it sounds like, you know, I just want to know in which direction to lead parents. And mm -hmm. it sounds like maybe more visual, like actually attending the meetings, which I know is now limited. And the format for that is a little bit different now, um, that that might be more impactful hearing how it's directly affecting a person. Um, like, for example, we had a PLTI member, third um, generation, the third class, 
which um, lost her job because mm -hmm. she had to deal with distance learning with her kids and she had to choose between helping her children or her job, you know, where it was at home and she dropped the ball and, and she, you know, that affected that family immensely. So uh, we, yeah. we have, you know, so many cases where, you know, their vote might be different, their opinion on how they might um, see distance learning is gonna be different from another family member that like, for example, my case is both my children have asthma. One of them has real severe asthma. So my, again, my opinion may differ from somebody else's opinion, but my job is just kind of trying to make sure that everybody's being heard and going to the district um, to give their experience and to, to give their, um, their vote or their say in the matter. Right, and, and you know, that, like we were talking about uh, earlier, I don't know if you were listening in on it, but um, you know, that real succinct message where it, you're conveying what you want to convey um, in, a, in a clear and concise way that, um, you know, and that goes with emails too. You know, it, think about if you were to get a hundred um, different emails and they all had word counts of, you know, 2000 words, you know, is somebody going to be able to sift through all of that and really get the key takeaways from it. But, you know, I can speak for what, what touches me and that is hearing people's personal stories. Don't tell me about what happened, you know, in, in New York or, you know, even LA. Those aren't the things that are impactful to me. I wanna know how is this impacting the people that I was elected to serve. So that's, that's all I can say about it. So Leo, let me ask you a question. Can we go on for a few minutes or what's it like in terms of time? Uh, if everybody, if Bethany is, is good with time and, and others are, obviously, right, uh, guests can drop off at, at any, any minute if they need to go. But uh, me, uh, personally, I can leave this open if we, if we need to get going and ask uh, certain questions. So Bethany, are you okay for a few more minutes or you want to answer? Sure, if there are other questions, I can hang out for a few minutes and then, you know, if people want to follow up, um, you know, through the, wherever they're accessing this right now, I can certainly answer additional questions that way. And you know, I've got my, my dozens of email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody will find a way to reach me. I'm yeah, sure. I just wanted to say that Rosa's question was perfect. The real PLTI. How do you be strategic? Mm -hmm. How do you? It's no accident that we taught three minutes in terms of public speaking, because that's what usually you get in public comments. I over E, as as we said, but it's really how do you influence decision makers? And her question was really good. I mean, do you fill out a form or do you go to a board meeting or do you talk to your you know, board member, et cetera? So right. I thought yeah. it was a great, great question. Right. And, and they can, I, I always say, you know, the public comment, that's your time. Come and speak. Um, we do have a time limit of 20 minutes um, for public comment, but typically um, we will vote to extend it if it's not a tremendously long list of people still to get to. But otherwise, you know, if we have 40 people that show up and they all want to speak for three minutes, then we just can't accommodate that during the public comment section. Um, but they are welcome to stay and we can, you know, take up public comment again at the, at the end of the meeting if they still want to yeah. have their have their time. Okay, can, I, can I add on real quick? Sure. Okay, so when I was meaning about earlier about being at the school and feeling like we were more um, pushed out is that I, I was there and I did activate and I really got involved more with the kids on this term instead of just actually this the office or the teachers. And on that day when we did get the call, when they decided that we weren't going to come back to school was probably the most emotional imprint on my daughter that I've, I've ever noticed in her. She really took it hard because this year in junior high, I don't know if you guys have noticed that the exposure rate to all these things and like a sexual behavior and suicidal behavior and depression behavior skyrocketed. So that was all exposed to them in like this short, like conducted 
like area because the year before that Noah's been on homeschool. So it was just kind of like, it was just a shock and then it was cut off. So there was friends to worry about. And so when we, when you, when I said that there was nobody, I felt like I could reach out to because the school kind of felt like, no, we don't need it. It's in, and then you make that comment, like the governor disregarded how you guys were feeling too, because he made that decision for us. And then Rose is saying, are you making sure that you're hearing the parents who are saying that our kids are really struggling? So how do we sum that up to just a quick little point? So it's not 193 pages, but it's definitely like 130 people did say that their kids are struggling. You know, how do we just say like this many people say this? Cause I did fill out the form and I did make my concerns and my points, but like you said, that's a million comments to read through. It had impossible. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That was, it was an extraordinary amount of them. And, you know, because it wasn't just the parents that we uh, were reviewing comments from, it was students, it was, um, you know, staff, it was a wide range of individuals who were taking part in that. But um, yeah, I, I, say, you know, get your thoughts down on paper. I'm, as Alan mentioned earlier, I'm very analytical. I am very much a planner. Um, you know, I would maybe jot down a, a few things that you want to get your point across um, by sharing. And, um, you know, if there are others that you can consolidate with, then, um, you know, uh, you know, you can do it that way. Uh, I know in the past, you know, when there have been times that they were going to shut schools down, that, um, you know, not, not this, but completely close a school. Um, those are very challenging situations. It, it brings on a lot of emotions and parents come out in droves to, to, um, you know, say their, their piece, um, then uh, you know you might designate a speaker who speaks on behalf of a larger group, and so that then can cut back some of the time. Um, but you know, don't don't let the uh, social distancing things, uh, ways that we have to deal with that, impact your coming to you know bringing even if it's not you going physically to the meeting space and taking part in the meeting that way, you know, send your email, find a, we'll find a way to make it work. Um, so, uh, but I, I know that we're not going to be hearing, it's not going to be on the agenda before we'll have it as an information item in December. And like I said, it comes to us as an information item, and then it comes to us for an actual vote uh, the following meeting. So the meeting before um, that January meeting. So um, I, I don't recall the exact date. It's, uh, it's middle of December um, that we'll, we'll be hearing about it again. But I'm certain the parents are going to show up the, every meeting until that point in time um, to share with their experiences. And I don't think that it's lost on people. Um, I do think that they're hearing the parents. I'm not gonna say I'm the only one that's hearing that side of things. Um, there are just a ton of people who are terrified, um, you know, parents who don't wanna send their kids to school still. And, and so, um, but you know, some, some board members just wanna be extra cautious. And, you know, we're starting to see some of the private schools in the county um, going back to school. We're seeing public school districts. Uh, Orange County just sent back, I don't know the exact number of school districts in Orange County, but there are a lot. <laughs> and several of them decided to either go back um, hybrid or I think some of them also decided to go back 100% in person. Um, you know, they're, they're finding what works for them. And so I do think that we'll be able to see a little bit of that play out. And I'm, I'm in agreement with, you know, my fellow board members that I don't want us to be the test case in Solano County to see, well, what happens if, but at the same time, I think that we can find workarounds to, um, to, to make it work if we decide to go back and, you know, until the time that, that comes to a vote, I'm just going to continue to encourage our, um, our staff to be as, you know, creative as possible and really 
um, find ways to improve the experience for each individual child based on what their needs are. Okay, that's excellent. Um, so I wanna thank uh, Bethany, we'll give you a shout out. You can hold your hands up, you can clap, um, but thank you so much. And PLTI alumni, so this is cool. We're gonna wanna replicate this, meaning that if you're interested in doing an interview um, to talk about really what you've been doing since PLTI, and don't feel bad if you're like, oh, gee, Bethany ran for a school board. She's won. What am I doing with my life? That's ridiculous. You're all doing great things. Bethany's enjoying that, I think. <laughs> so um, I do want to thank Bethany, but really, um, please send Leo and myself or both of us an email if you want to do an interview like this. Um, I think uh, it has a, a lot of value and a lot of merit. A lot of people are going to be watching this. Um, and um, so I'm hoping other people will want to go on and do a Zoom uh, live chat. So anything else, Leo? Leo, again, thank you so much for the great work that you do. Uh, Volunteer of the Year is what I'm going to nominate you for. Um, I agree. Really? He's been helping with my campaign too. So yeah, I'm, I'm really that. grateful for that. Yeah. Make a motion. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you so much, everybody. So Leo, this is gonna go out to uh, all the PLTI alumni and then maybe some school people, but we can talk about that. I think this was a very, very, very well done um, session with Bethany. It's so timely now in terms of the pandemic, but also just you know running for office and being there as a parent leader. So, um, I have a feeling that we should do our closing, you know, how, one word, how do you feel, but probably can't do that on Zoom. Um, I see a... Um... <laughs> Rocio. <laughs> okay, no, just a quick, a quick, quick, quick announcement. Please, anyone in Solano County who needs assistance with the rent, apply for the rental assistance program at catholiccharities.com. It opens for this week. It was closed already and we were lucky Thanks to that organizing and reaching out. So we were able to get some more funding for Solano County. So Terrific. can I ask yes. you a question? Because I saw that uh, and I know somebody that applied for the first round and yes. I'm wondering is do, if they already applied, do they have to apply again or is their no. application still in the system no. for this? If they are already applied, please ask them to check their inbox and their spam because we have been sending emails as soon as the mm -hmm. applications were accepted because mm -hmm. we need the documents to verify their ah, information okay. otherwise we cannot proceed but ah, anything okay. send me an email and i will try to follow up with that person or to find who is in charge of their case okay or if there was something missing and they didn't qualify or anything i can give you an answer or Wonderful. find the Thank person you. to give you an answer. You are answer, the right person to have on this call. Yeah. So. Yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> That's one of the good things of PLTI. We learned that it's not always we have the answers, but how we network with others. So yeah, thank absolutely. you, Leo, for helping us too. And and yes, please send me an email and I will try to find out the information for to help them. But that please works. apply and share, share, share. No, Rocio, it's uh, CCY also.org. No, yes. Org. Org. Oh, I, org. I wrote down com. Sorry, it's org. <laughs> yes. All right. And the okay. and the applications are open again. They open today. And it has an option to submit all your documents right now. So that's even better, even faster. So but if they already apply, they already have a a, a place in our waiting list. So that's okay. the difference, Bethany. If okay. she already applied or him already applied, they already have a, a, a place ahead of those who are just applying okay. starting today. Okay. 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 So here's what Thank we're you. gonna here's what we're gonna say at the end. We're all gonna say together, vote, vote, vote. Inform.
Vote. And vote. Get informed right. and Get vote. Get informed and vote. Absolutely. Yes. Educate yourself and, and educate. Vote. Yes. Yes. And Bethany, I love seeing your banners in the city whenever I go to Susun. I'm like, Thank I know you. her. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I had I had a, a lady show up with some uh, and some DoorDash for me. There's a little plug. Um, I'm from DoorDash, and she's like, "Is that you? I just passed by your sign, and I looked at my driver's or my passenger seat, and I said, I think that's the person that I'm bringing food to.' <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's me. She knew because yeah. my my back of my car is all decorated with my, uh, <laughs> my school board stuff on it. I'm a rolling billboard, you know. <laughs> do what I can so all right guys all right. those of you listening live on Facebook send us a note if you like this format and if you want to be interviewed I'm not too hard on the interviews I let people know in advance um and I I took it easy on Bethany tonight because thank I, you okay so again <laughs> thank you Leo Karen great to see you Rocio Amanda um, and I know there's people. Uh, Funny guys, John has. Yeah. All right. So, Leo, thanks again. It, it's seamless when you do these things. I really appreciate it. Okay. Right, Thank you, everyone. All right. Remember, vote, vote, yep. vote, vote. All okay. right. Thanks bye again. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Take care.